So Morgan is up next, and we'll be talking about uh, potential effects of climate change on valley fever. Great. Thank you, Bridget. Hi, my name is Morgan Gorris, and I am a staff scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and I study how climate and weather affect human health. Uh, so why Los Alamos National Laboratory? Well, climate change and human health are both matters of national security. Um, climate change is already adversely affecting human health through things like temperature extremes and heat waves, uh, droughts and floods, and stresses on mental health. It's also expected to shift where environmental infectious diseases are, the seasonality of disease, and how many cases we see from year to year. And valley fever is not immune to feeling those effects. So today I'm gonna to discuss some of the potential effects that climate change will have on valley fever. Got it, it's a left button. So one of the graphs that you've seen already that I think a lot of us in the room stare at is the time series of case counts of valley fever cases in the United States and reportable states. And we see a variation in the number of cases from year to year. And we also see that valley fever cases are increasing over time. And one question that has come up frequently is, is this an early signal of climate change? So Gail pointed out that there are a lot of different uh, things that might be influencing these variations over time. Um, but to start to think about how case counts and valley fever might be affected by climate change, we come back again to the life cycle of coccidioides. So this is a life cycle up into the point where it enters a human or mammalian host. So in step one, we see coccidioides growing in the environmental form uh, in soils. It primarily grows in um, soils, desert-like soils in semi-arid areas. And then it grows when there's any type of, when there's nutrients and moisture available for it to be happy. And if there's any type of environmental stress on the fungus, it breaks apart into those tiny spores, which can then become airborne, as shown in step three. Uh, these spores are incredibly small. They're about two to five microns in length, so tens of them can fit across the width of a human hair. And any type of soil disturbance, whether it's digging in the dirt, like those construction activities, or a high winds event can cause those spores to become airborne, and that's when humans can breathe them in and become sick. So there are several parts of this life cycle that are directly affected by climate, weather, and the surrounding environmental conditions. Uh, first, just the area that coccidioides is living, and valley fever is endemic, is affected by climate. Uh, we know that this is a fungus that primarily lives in those desert-like soils, and so climate conditions are likely constraining where the fungus is living. One challenge that the valley fever community has had is mapping out where this disease is a risk and who might be uh, at risk for contracting valley fever. Uh, one approach that um, I've taken in collaboration actually with University of California, Irvine, when I started my PhD work there, um, is using case counts, human case counts, valley fever, as a proxy for the presence of the fungus and being able to use connections between climate conditions at the county level and case counts at the county level to understand where valley fever might be a threat. And so when we started looking at these connections between climate and case counts, we found that counties that had higher levels of mean annual temperature <coughs> and lower levels of mean annual precipitation, so essentially the desert-like areas, had the highest level of incidence. So what we did is we turned that mathematical relationship around and we were able to map out in geographic space where we think valley fever might currently be endemic. And this is the map that we came up with. Um, you can see most of the southwest is lit up as potentially endemic. And what was uh, very intriguing is there's these three counties in southeastern Washington state that also popped up as endemic, uh, which the CDC had added on to their endem endemicity map uh, because of uh, cases that had happened in early 2010s. 
So since this model was based on climate conditions, we can then use future projections of climate to estimate who may be at risk for contracting valley fever in the future. So these are projections that we did for valley fever in response to a high greenhouse gas emissions, high climate warming scenario. And you can see the endemic area expands further north through time. This is cycling from uh, present day to year 2100. By year 2100, the endemic area might reach the US-Canadian border. So what was once a disease that was primarily limited to the southwestern United States could be a disease of the western United States as the western half of the US remains dry and increases in temperature, allow the habitat suitability for coccidioides to expand. Uh, climate conditions are only one kind of facet that might be constraining where coccidioides lives. Um, this is another map looking at the predicted coccidioides habitat suitability index by Dobos et al. Uh, using literature review from soil parameters and soil conditions that may be helping structure where coccidioides lives in the soil. Uh, areas in green here are least suitable and areas in red here are most suitable. Uh, so in the future, uh, we need to work together to combine this information between climate conditions and soil conditions suitable for the fungus at the sub-county level to better understand who may be at risk. So another aspect of the life cycle that may be affected by climate change is the amount of environmental growth and stress on the fungus, uh, shown in steps one and two here. So there's a paradigm in the Coxy community that Coxidioides has a grow and blow hypothesis. So in step one, when there's nutrients available and moisture available, it's growing happily in the environment. And then when it becomes stressed, and it, there's some type of soil disturbance, it blows. And what this means uh, is that it's susceptible to changes in weather and climate conditions like Jen just showed. So this is a model that we're working on where rainfall can explain a vast majority of the monthly variance in valley fever cases in the San Joaquin Valley of California. Uh, the observations of valley fever incidents are in black here, and our models in red, which was developed using two uh, predictors of, or measurements of rainfall. And so we see evidence for these connections between uh, weather and climate conditions and case counts. So creating explanatory models like this or forecast systems for valley fever is going to be especially important as our climate patterns shift into the future. So that way we can understand when there might be an outbreak year for valley fever. Uh, yet another piece of the life cycle uh, that is affected by climate change is the transmission dynamics or exposure dynamics um, to humans, both on short term uh, or short scale transport, uh, like digging in the dirt, and longer term transport. And so we talked about how the habitat suitability for valley fever might expand in the future. But a big question is how coccidioides will spread and inhabit th those new areas. So yet again, we come back to the endozoan small mammal reservoir hypothesis, um, where rodents are running around with coccidioides, and they might be traveling to new locations that are more suitable uh, for their uh, habitat, for food availability, and then dying in those new locations and coccidioides could then return to the soil uh, and, and inhabit that location. Uh, another way that coccidioides may spread is through the airborne or dust transport. Um, I don't think we can discount this as a very feasible mechanism for transport, especially because we have evidence like marine mammals becoming sick with valley fever. Uh, so essentially, the spores can become airborne in these highly endemic areas in the Central Valley of California or other coastal counties that are highly endemic um, and be spread airborne over the oceans where marine mammals can breathe them in and become sick. Uh, climate change is expected to cause longer, more intense periods of droughts. Um, 
So following on to Jen's talk, we could see an excess of cases following these drought periods. Um, it's, going, it's going to increase our ambient level of dust in the atmosphere. And these drying conditions are also going to increase the number of dust storms in the future. Uh, now, research connecting valley fever cases and dust storms um, is still ongoing and is very difficult to conduct because um, our databases of dust storms or dust events um, are kind of finicky and have their own issues with them. But I don't think we can discount dust storms as a feasible mechanism for transporting these spores and helping the spores establish or coxie establish itself in new suitable conditions. So at least three facets of this life cycle uh, may be affected by climate change in the future, and there are others that I'm happy to chat about. Um, so where the disease is in the environment, uh, how many cases there are from year to year, and these transmission or exposure dynamics, and these could all lead to outbreaks of valley fever. And we can't eradicate coccidioides from the environment. Um, so there's one straightforward uh, suggestion that I'd like to make, uh, and that is disease surveillance programs. So uh, Mitsuro and I essentially made the same graph on the right-hand side here, uh, looking at uh, the states where valley fever is considered potentially endemic or endemic in green, and they're reporting their cases. Uh, states in blue, where we don't think it's endemic and they're reporting cases. And then states in yellow, which are endemic or might be endemic and are not reporting their valley fever cases. So although valley fever is a nationally notifiable disease, uh, states are not required to report. They make that decision uh, at the state level or by jurisdiction. Uh, we know that disease surveillance programs increase disease sur uh, awareness, both among the community members and among physicians, which can lead to a reduced time to diagnosis and ultimately better health, health outcomes for patients. Um, understanding the case loads and the case burden across the United States is going to help promote vaccine development and eventual distribution of the vaccine when it becomes available. And we are missing information that could help us better understand those climate and environmental conditions that are structuring disease dynamics. I'd like to point out one case in particular, and that's the state of Texas. About 9% of the US population lives in the state of Texas. And if we assume that Texas has a statewide um, incidence rate, that's 10% of that in Arizona, about 4,000 over 4,000 cases of valley fever are going unreported in Texas each year. And for a disease that's reporting about 20,000 cases a year, that's huge. So increased disease surveillance is going to be imperative, especially in the future as this disease progresses and, and expands northward into new areas. So in conclusion, um, cases are increasing. And is this an early signal of climate change? I think it's too early to make a definitive answer, but this is a signal that we shouldn't ignore. There are several aspects of the coccidioides life cycle that are going to be directly affected by climate and shifts in precipitation and increasing temperatures in the future. Uh, and that includes where the disease is, so ultimately who is at risk for contracting this, this disease, uh, the number of annual cases, and if we have outbreak years or years that are following <coughs> drought causing increased case counts. And also these transmission and dust event processes. Uh, so disease surveillance can help us understand who is at risk. And without disease surveillance programs, I think we're doing a disservice <coughs> to protecting the health of our nation. Uh, so I'd like to end there. Thank you to the National Academies for having us, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you so much, Morgan. Um, 